Okay. Um, okay, we are recording now. Well, welcome to Tom Talks. Let me, let me, uh, to minimize Jackie here so that doesn't get into to the way. Um, so, welcome to Tom Talks. We're going to talk about uh, woody plants. Uh, Identification and Ecology Day will be heavy on the identification part of it, but it's impossible for me to talk about trees without talking about where they grow and how they grow. To me, that's just a part of the experience of being around trees and studying them, is being outdoors and being in, in the landscape with them. Uh, this is a product warning label. Uh, it's good to know about trees. Just remember, nobody ever made any big money knowing about trees. So if you tuned in today to make big money, you think this is your ticket to success, um, maybe you should try a different webinar. Um, this is your ticket to uh, a lot of meaningful experiences in life, but not big money. And uh, But relationships, yes, relationships are good. Uh, I've had many good relationships with trees over the years um, uh, and very meaningful associations with them. So if you're here for uh, to get to know trees in that way, you're in the right place. Uh, and oh, and the other thing is that trees will never make you look ridiculous or feel ridiculous. Uh, at least over 40 years now since I identified my first tree um, and uh, not once have they ever made me feel ridiculous. They puzzled me, they befuddled me, but they've never made me feel ridiculous. Ah, uh, this is jumping right into to trees here. This is a, this is a, I want to start off with a thinker question here. How does water get to the top of a tree? Now you're thinking this is, this must be pretty simple. I mean, trees have been around forever. People have been around forever. Science understands everything. But actually this was quite a puzzle. Scientists, tree physiologists really didn't know the answer to this question 50 years ago. They, um, uh, there isn't, doesn't seem to be any pump in the roots to push the water up. Uh, all the testing they did said there is no pump down there. And if a, if, a, if a plumber tries to suck water up in a pipe by putting a suction pump in the top and trying to draw water up in a pipe, it gets about 30 feet up, and then the pump cavitates, so a vacuum forms in the line, and the pump stops working. It's, but trees can grow 100 feet tall, uh, 200 feet tall, uh, with some of them 300, you know, 300 feet tall. So how does it possibly get water that high in a tree? And so, so our first, first lesson here is about water movement in trees. When air gets hotter, it holds more water. Understand, Mr. Man? I think so. Lowering the relational humidity creates in the air a distinct cupidity for water. Let's call it a vapor debt to make energy. I'm going to need to get light from the rays of sun. No flashlight will get the job done. It takes the sun to energize, to maximize the water's motivation, to send the signal down, get water circulation. You can see any power to pull the water from my leaves all the way down the tower to my root and membrane. No sign of strength about water transportation. If you are a tree, think with your body when the sun reaches the leaves, that signal will go down. See, water is a polar molecule. The ends are charged and they follow the rule. Opposites attract, attract. These molecules are stacked. A stacking of attraction provides the traction. Think about it, think about it, think about it, think about it. Sun in the rising tide is in. Thank you. 
if anyone asks you that question about water gets to the top of the tree, that's the response I want you to give. You're gonna to have to listen to this a few times to get the tune down. Uh, that will surprise them to no end. Uh, do a little musical number. Uh, thank you, Jackie. Um, so what we're gonna do uh, is we're just about to, I, I love this book, Where the Wild Things Are, Hanging from Trees. Um, used to read it uh, endlessly to my, my children years ago. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to go through the trees uh, and I'm going to do about eight to 15 or so Then we're going to have these little quizzes and the quizzes are there not to grade you in any sense. I mean, if you want to keep track of what you get right and wrong, that's, that's fine. Uh, but they're really more for review. And so when, when the quizzes start, we'll ask you to, to put answers in the chat, in the chat box. Uh, uh, if you want to participate in them, and Jackie can read them out to me, and so that'll be that'll be a part of the review. So that's sort of the pace we're going to go at, and the pace is really will be determined a bit by you. If you have a lot of questions, we'll slow down and deal with those questions. If you if you uh, don't have those questions, and we'll move ahead a little bit more quickly. So we're going to start with the oaks, uh, which is where we ought to start. About 300 years ago, if you took a walk in the Chicago area, you would have found about. Uh, 90 some percent of the trees, 95 percent of the trees uh, above six inches in diameter were oaks. Uh, incredibly important and that's simply because they're very resistant to fires and uh, Native Americans would burn the landscape every few years and so they, they were the dominant, by far the dominant group in the landscape. And the two most important ones were bur oak and white oak. Uh, when we look at oaks, um, we, we divide them into, uh, into two groups, and those groups are the red oak group and the white oak group. And there are a number of differences between the two groups with the red oaks. The acorns take two years to mature from flowering, and the white oaks, it's one year. If you look at the wood, it's slightly different in its anatomy. But the thing that's easiest to appreciate about the two groups are the leaves. The white oak group has these rounded lobes. And the red oak group has pointed lobes, and while it doesn't show it on this drawing, little bristles sticking out from the ends of the point. So it's pretty easy to recognize the difference between the two groups. And if you're if you're starting off with your tree identification, it's the first thing to do to, to group it, to, to say, all right, well, it's one of the red oak group. And so my choice is now constricted in this case to northern pin oak or red oak. If it's a white oak group, it's bur oak or white oak. So if we look at these uh these two, we can see the, the, the rounding of, of the lobes on both of them. Notice how the bur oak leaf, now this is the lobe and this is the sinus. Lobe, sinus. So those are the words that I'll use over and over again. And with, this, with a bur oak leaf, the sinus is cut almost all the way in the mid vein here in the middle of the leaf. At the end of the leaf is sort of big and fat because the sinuses are very shallow. Notice in the white oak leaf over here that the sinuses are about the same depth as you go from top to bottom in the leaf. I can't, sh I didn't show that in any of the pictures. It would be hard to show in a picture. There's a very fine fuzz, what we call a pubescence on the underside of a bur oak leaf. A white oak leaf has a smooth, waxy surface. And if we look at the acorns, and acorns are really some of the best identification uh, characteristics uh, for the rope oaks in this part of, of the world. A little bit harder when you go in the southeastern United States, but, but here the acorns are very diagnostic. Here's the white oak acorn with a very knobby cap, and we'll have some other pictures of that through the day as I'm comparing it to other species. Very knobby both to look at and to touch, and the bur oak with this loose fringe. The bur oak cap covers anywhere from a half to two-thirds of the acorn. The white oak cap probably less than one-third of the acorn. Um, and after a year or so, the nut itself rots away, but the cap will be left behind. Behind, It's very rot resistant. So I don't know how many hours of my life I've spent scratching on the ground under oak trees looking for some fragment of an acorn cap to make sure I had the identification correct. Bark, again, is very sharply contrasting between these two. The white oak has this beautiful gray scaly bark, whereas the bur oak is a couple of shades darker gray and it's deeply furrowed. Now either one of these can sort of shed its outer bark, and look very smooth at the base, but if you look up, look up about 10 feet you'll always see this characteristic bark pattern, the gray scaly bark of the white oak and the furrowed bark of the bur oak. 
Uh, the twigs are, this is getting a little bit hard to tell these two apart. In general, you're going to find some very fine, both of them have very short buds, some very, very short hairs and tiny little scales on a bur oak bud, whereas the white oak bud is smoother and more waxy. But those, those generally there are other characteristics to tell those two apart that are a bit easier. What I want to do now is to, uh, it's a delve into just a little, little, little ecology of these two very important species in, in McHenry County. Good morning, We're, welcome to Glacial Park. We're in the oldest savanna restoration in Glacial Park. This area that you're looking at right here was first uh, restored, the invasive uh, honeysuckle and buckthorn removed in the summer of 1988. And in just a minute, we're gonna walk up that hill over in this direction. Uh, to an area that was cleared in 1989. So this old savanna restoration uh, stayed open because that was a drought year. A lot of the honeysuckle and buckthorn that tried to re-sprout even before we were using herbicides didn't uh, died because of the drought. But you see the abundance of Joe pie wheat here, lots of geraniums on the ground here, lots of ground floor plants. We have uh, uh, bottle brush grass, uh, Nodding wild rye over here. So we've got a lot of a lot of those plants came in with our restoration efforts. But the reason I brought you here is to look at at this at, at a soil contrast, and it's really based on geology. All of Glacial Park is, uh, or this part of Glacial Park is what we call an ice contact landscape, meaning that there was lots of blocks of ice left around as the glacier was receding, and it left this lumpy landscape. Bump. as the ice melts. So you see this valley here. This is a closed depression. It's uphill in every direction from where I'm standing. Uh, and valleys like this in Glacial Park for a combination of reasons that are hard to explain in a minute, uh, typically have fine textured clay and silt parent material here that was left behind. The geologic material that was left behind by the glacier and probably added to over the next 12,000 years as water flowed off of these surrounding hills, built this fine textured soil here, and that fine textured soil weathers to an acid soil profile. Uh, and that's really key to the occurrence of this. This is white oak. And uh, as Jackie looks around here, you're gonna see probably 95% of the trees are white oak. Here, white oaks really thrive in that fine textured acid soil. We have a shagbark hickory over there and a few others. But basically, this is a stand of white oak, and if you once you learn that, as you walk around Glacial Park, you can spot these these occurrences of fine textured soil, these pockets, by looking for the white oaks. Not just one, but look for these little communities of white oak like this. They're really telling you about a shift in in soil. Uh, so what we're going to do next is to walk up the hill, just just a few hundred yards away, walk up the hill, and take a look at a very different place. All right, well, we've walked just a couple hundred yards uh, up the trail and we've come up on this hill. And you can see, first of all, look down at my feet and all that gravel, the, the outwashed gravels that are really under all of Glacial Park, but are only exposed here and there, typically more often exposed near the tops of hills. Here they've come to the surface. And when they come to the surface, most of that gravel is limestone or dolomite, um, using the two words synonymously. Uh, and they weather, as they weather, they release a lot of calcium carbonate into the soil, and so the soil remains alkaline. Even after uh, 14, 18,000 years of weathering, the soil can, is still alkaline. And that highly alkaline soil really prevents white oaks from growing here. If you try to plant white oaks around your house where the soil has been disturbed and turned over, and the builders left a lot of alkaline material at the surface, you'll notice that the white oak, turn, the leaves turn yellow, it gets chlorosis, is never healthy and probably dies. Same thing happens in nature. But bur oaks are very tolerant of alkaline, alkaline material. And if you look around, virtually every tree you're looking at here is a bur oak. Uh, so both of them are tolerant of fire, and we'll talk about fire more in one of, one of our other little uh, ecological um, short videos here. But really the contrast between these two places, only about 100, 200 yards apart, is a contrast in this soil parent material and the soil that, that weathers from that parent material, very acid in one place, dominated by white oak, 
pure, very alkaline, and dominated by burrow. So uh, when, we're, when we're working in a landscape and walking through a landscape, that knowing, knowing your landforms and soils really tells you a lot about the distribution of, of woody plants. So in a, in a typical morainal situation made of clays, uh, silt and clay soil, weathered to an acid profile, white oak is often the dominant. Get to moisture positions on that moraine, red oak will increase in its Frequency when we get to these dry alkaline gravel hilltops, which we were in just that last video, bur oak becomes dominant. Uh, the oaks drop out when you get into a fence situation. You may have things like the beaked willow go down into an acid bog, and you're and you're, and you're looking at poison sumac or um, or leather leaf. So there's that sort of theme to the organization of woody plants, trees, and shrubs in a landscape, and that has to do with the soil. All right, let's get back to, to a little tree identification now. Um, this is, now we're gonna look at two groups. Remember, in the, this is the red oak group. Look at the pointy, pointy lobes of the leaf and bristle tips. See the white oak here with its rounded lobes. So, uh, so they're both in the red oak group. What, what's the distinction between the two? Just look back and forth. Notice how the sinuses go much deeper on the hills oak leaf, the lobes therefore are longer and skinnier and they tend to flare a bit at the tips. One, one, one warning, oaks are lovely trees. When you're learning to identify trees, the tendency is always to go in and tunnel vision focus on one leaf that's in your hand. I warn you, on oak trees you'll find 20 different variations on the same leaf shape on the same tree. Always start out uh, looking at the whole tree, step back, look at the whole tree, go up, look at a leaf, look at another leaf, look at another leaf, look at the buds, look at the bark, step back, look at the bark up above, down below. You're gonna see changing patterns and shapes everywhere you look. Usually, in a, when you look in a tree book, the picture they show you in the tree book of a, of, of, you know, of a sugar maple or, a, or an oak tree, that leaf is the leaf from the crown of the tree, out in the sun. That's where the tree will make that characteristic leaf form. If you look at the same, on the same tree, if you look at a leaf inside of the crown, down near the bottom, where you can often get to with your hands, where that leaf is in the shade, it will often look very different. The sinus will be shallower, uh, and not at all like the picture in the book. So, uh, in mo most of the pictures I'm showing you here are pictures of crown leaves, deep sinuses, and relatively, narrow lobes for the hills oak, much shallower sinuses, uh, and more tapering lobes on the, uh, on the red oak. Uh, when we look at the acorns, the hills oak has probably the smallest, on average, smallest acorns in the Chicago area. It's hard to give you that idea from a picture. I can, of course, expand this to any size I wanted. Blue jays love these hills oak acorns. They tend to really focus on the small acorns and they will uh, strip the hills oak acorns pretty quickly from the hills oak tree. They're the hardest acorn to collect. There's been a lot of acorn collecting and experiments with squirrels and mice and oak reproduction work over the last 10 years. And these are hard to collect because the blue jays grab them before they ever hit the ground. Notice how the cap here is thicker relative to the size of the acorn, sort of dome-shaped on top, uh, and covers about half the acorn. By contrast with red oak, this is a much larger acorn probably on average the largest acorn in the Chicago area, though Burr Oaks and other places can be much larger. Uh, and the cap is like a little beret, sits on top, it's generally a sort of shinier chestnut brown color. So the beret-like cap that sits on top of the acorn, the bowl-like cap here, at least relatively thicker in comparison to the size of the acorn of the hills of, make those two pretty easy to see. And again, the caps will always be under a, under a a large tree, even if the acorns have rotted away. The bark is very similar between the two, only it's a finer texture on the hills oak and becomes somewhat more blocky at the base. The red oak has more of this vertical pattern to it and these silvery ridges, uh, often um, called ski trails, going up and down uh, the bark of a red oak, particularly as you step back from a red oak and look up the trunk you'll see these, this pattern again, go forward, step back, look at the whole tree, go up, look at the 
twig back up, look at the whole tree again. That's how to look at oaks. The twigs are probably one of the best identification characters for these two. Red oaks have this conical bud uh, with very few or no hairs, chestnut brown in color here. It looks almost a little bit more pinkish, sometimes with a few little white hairs at the tip. By contrast, when you look at the hills oak, uh, the scales at the base are usually clean of any hairs, so they're glabrous or smooth at the base, but you always have some tawny brownish hairs at the tip of the bud. Uh, they're somewhat more angular and pentagonal in cross section than, than red oak. Uh, so, um, and again, like many other features on oak trees, the best, the most characteristic buds of the tree will be formed in twigs that are in the full sun. I don't know why that is, but that's the way it is. So. Um, Often when the squirrels cut twigs out of the crown of the tree and they fall to the ground, those are the ones that really show the species character the best. Oh, and this is the form of a hill's oak. If this were a red oak, all these dead branches would have pruned off and it would be a smooth bowl to the tree. And the hill's oak, it holds these old dead branches. One of its other common names is northern pin oak for all these sort of dead branches poking, poking out at you uh, at the base of the tree. And these two, uh, two more oaks, uh, these are two that you'll find in wetter places. Neither one of them common in uh, northeastern Illinois, but, but both of them are around. Pin oak, I don't believe is in the county, but it's not, it, it is in Lake County, just over the line. Uh, Quercus bicolor uh, swamp white oak does occur in the county. We have native populations on Narango Moraine in the western part of the county. And it's quite common along the Des Plaines River and some other places in Lake County. So this one, this one's not super uncommon in the Chicago area. Uh, pin oak, uh, more common as you go east. This one becomes very common in the Indiana Dunes uh, National Park and in in the acid swamps there. So anyway, the, uh, the white oak, the swamp white oak uh, is unusual for oaks in our region because it doesn't seem to have those deep sinuses and long lobes, rather, uh, they're just sort of rounded teeth along the edge of the leaf um, with no deep sinuses. Uh, that, that, that in itself will I'll tell you what a swamp white oak is, whereas the pin oak has these long narrow lobes much like hills oak, but notice how the lobes don't flare and they're almost at right angles, particularly these last, these middle two lobes are almost at right angles to the central axis of the leaf. Really characteristic form to the pin oak. Uh, compare that to the hills oak leaf where you're gonna have more flaring at the tips. I can guarantee you this will confuse you at times, but once you get used to it and you start looking for those flaring tips, and again, sometimes the leaves are at the bottom of a tree on a large pin oak, really don't have this characteristic form, but if you look up on the tree, or if you look for trees that have fallen out of, out of the crown and on the ground, you'll see this flaring of the leaf tips and know which of the pin oaks you're looking at. This is the Quercus palustris, the pin oak, and uh, Bill's oak sometimes is called the northern pin oak. The acorns of pin oak, Quercus palustris, are very characteristic, very small, uh, even smaller than the, than the hills oak acorns, and have a very flat, very thin cap on top, they look like they've been squished, nose to tail here, um, with a very, uh, very flat, uh, thin cap. With a swamp white oak has this long stalk and it's the only tree in the Eastern United States, the only oak in the Eastern United States, I think the only oak in the United States, but I'm not sure about that one, with a long stalk acorn. Or there's Quercus pedunculata in the British Isles that has that long stalk, but in, in uh, the Eastern United States, there's only that the only swamp white oak is that long stalk, and that stalk, like the acorn cap, doesn't rot away quickly. So if you start scratching under the ground in winter looking at trees, wondering whether you're looking at a swamp white oak, look for that stalk attached to the acorn cap. Just put a white oak there for comparison. Look at the, the, the knobby cap of the white oak. It's very knobby, both to look at and to touch. No no looseness to the scales at all. You get a little bit of looseness to the scales here along the edge with, uh, with a swamp white oak, but not that, not that knobbiness at all. 
the bark of the two is that, well, with swamp white oak, this is a dead ringer for white oak at the base. It's gray and scaly, maybe a little bit scalier than white oak, but that's, that's really hard to tell apart. But, uh, but if you look on the upper branches, this is what you'll see on a, on a swamp white oak. On a branch that's maybe an inch in diameter, you'll see the bark start peeling off. That is characteristic. That is very unlike bur oak, which will have some ridges forming on, on these one inch branches, but it won't have those big peeling scales and white oak branches in this size are just smooth without any exfoliation of the bark at all. With pin oak, it's a lot like northern, or uh, yeah, with pin oak, it's a lot like hills oak bark, very finely textured at the base. And as you look up, it does a little bit of an imitation of red oak, but a thin, thin bark. Uh, much finer texture than, than a red oak bark. There's the classic form of a pin oak with the branches at the bottom going down, the branches at the top going up, and the branches in the middle going out. Very common street tree. In fact, that's where you'll see most of it in Chicago where it's planted along streets. This one is very pH sensitive, as I mentioned about white oaks. And so it's not often a really good choice for planting in the Chicago area. It tends to grow well for a while, and right when you get used to it and enjoy the form and the color, it starts to get chlorotic, the leaves turn yellow, and it uh, becomes unhealthy and then starts to die because our soils are just too alkaline, particularly around trees and roads where people have mucked around with the soil and turned up that subsoil that's alkaline. The pin oaks are just often not a good. I would suggest if you want to plant a pin oak, always have your soil tested first and see if the pH is below seven. The last of our oaks, and this is a beauty. This one is, uh, is listed in McHenry County. I have not seen it in McHenry County. One normally expects to see pin oak where there is limestone or dolomite near the surface bedrock, or in areas where there are large limestone or dolomite boulders that are, that are in, around the soil. Uh, so it likes the alkaline nature of, of, of those soils. Here again, this doesn't look like a normal oak leaf, does it? It doesn't have those deep sinuses and long lobes. Rather, this has those teeth again, but notice as opposed to swamp white oak, the teeth actually come to points. They're not bristle tipped like the red oak group. In fact, this is in the white oak group. I mean, to every rule, there are always exceptions. Here, this actually does come to a little point, but without a bristle tip. Oh, well, it's gonna go. I just wanted to point out some of the features of a leaf, just throw in a little bit of terminology. This is the petiole. So later on, I'll be talking about the petiole of the leaf. That's what you'd commonly call the stalk. We'll be talking about leaf base, bases. We'll be talking about leaf tips and margins. Here the margin was too. So I'll be using that terminology as we go through the workshop today and tomorrow. The acorns of chinkapin oak, are a size smaller than white oak, and overall they look a similar shape, but uh, the cap isn't knobby. It's a bit, uh, it's about the same depth in terms of covering only the top of the acorn, but it's not knobby. I think, yes, I put in a white oak cap here for comparison. Visually, you can see the difference, I think, and with your fingers, you can feel the difference really easily. I always encourage people to touch things. I think maybe it's for me, I'm a very manual person. And so the, the tactile sensations I remember, the sensation of the waxiness of the underside of a white oak leaf or the knobby cap or the bristly feel of a bur oak acorn, those are sensations I remember. It's just stored somewhere in my brain. They're hard to describe, but I see them. So I always encourage people to go up and look closely at a tree as long as you don't, um, Hit the tree or run into it with a car, it's fine. You can touch it, it won't hurt it. Um, the bark of chinkapin oak is a dead ringer for white oak. So if you're gonna to try to use the bark to tell the two apart, good luck. That's not one that I could use. Uh, uh, they're very, very similar. Uh, the buds, similar. Again, they're short, just a little bit more pointed on chinkapin oak than, than white oak. But again, that's not your best identification character. If you're around chinkapin oaks, the way I always know when I'm walking in a forest preserve or woods and there are chinkapin oaks on the ground, the way I always know is I'm always looking on the ground for rocks and whatever is down there. And I see chinkapin oak leaves on the ground. And then I look up and I start looking around to see where the trees are, look for this bark. 
uh, and then start looking for these little thin uh, acorn caps uh, to, to confirm the ID. Beautiful tree. Go to some of the Bedrock Canyon State Parks, uh, Shades and Turkey Run State Parks, and there are some Canyon State Parks in Eastern Iowa or Chinkapin Oak. It's really very common. Okay, this is our first quiz. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you in this first case, it will be pictures of leaves. Some of the quizzes will just be basically any tree part, but we're gonna show trees this first time around. What I'm gonna do is wait about 10 seconds. So if you wanna take part in the quiz, just get ready with your chat box and uh, quickly type in enough of the name of the tree that Jackie can tell what it is. I'll wait about 10 seconds. I'll spend a few seconds starting to describe the leaf and I'll give the answer and we'll see how you did. Okay, here we go. All right, here we have an oak leaf, obviously, very deep sinuses, relatively long, narrow lobes, and they're flaring at the tips. So that's what? That's our northern pin oak or hills oak, Quercus ellipsoidalis. How do we do, Jackie? We have some red oak, a uh, question maybe burr oak, and pin oak as possible answers. Okay, well, now look at, this is good. This is, what, this is why I'm doing this for review. So bur oak is one of the white oak groups. We would expect rounded lobes. The fact that they come to points, I know on this, given the background, you can't, it's very hard to see the bristles. But so we would be able to put it in that group of the red oaks of, of red oak and, and bur oak, or excuse me, red oak and hills oak by that, that shape. And remember with pin oak, Quercus palustris, these lobes tended to are sort of wedge shaped. They don't flare at the end like hills. So that's, that's good. That's good. That's exactly why we're doing this. Let's try another one. Okay, how do we do? We had a guess for a red oak and a okay. pin oak and the white oak. Okay, pin oak. Pin oak here is, is the correct answer. This is uh, Quercus palustris, deep sinuses, long narrow lobes. And notice they're not flaring at the tips. It's pretty typical pin oak leaf. You have pin oaks growing in your yard or in your neighborhood, and probably you have them somewhere within a couple blocks of your house. It's pretty common. Street tree, when you walk past, uh, look for that, um, you, know, you can look for that characteristic form of the lower branches pointing down, but look for these long, narrow lobes, these middle lobes pointing out and not flaring at the tips. How about this one? Okay, we've got a, an oak here that really doesn't have very deep sinuses at all. In fact, it has teeth, and we had two oaks that had these general shape of leaf without deep sinuses and long lobes. Uh, and, and this one is the uh, chinkapin oak. Notice that the, the teeth come to points. They're not bristle tips, but they come to points. That's the chinkapin. A lot of people guessed the right one on there. Oh, good, good. A, a few people guessed swamp white oak. Okay, well that's, that's close. I mean, if you're guessing swamp white oak, you're nearly there. In fact, I hope this is not much of a surprise. This is swamp white oak, and you'll see the contrast with these rounded oaks here. Very similar overall shape. Uh, um, you know, it, it may seem like I know everything about trees, but if I did, I would stop. Uh, in fact, I'm always learning, and individual leaves can trick you. Uh, and, uh, and I often find myself puzzling over leaf shapes when I'm out in the woods. Okay, here's, here's another one. Okay, now here we have one that has deep sinuses and at least some long narrow lobes, so we know it's not white oak or chinkapin oak, it's one of the others. The lobes are rounded, uh, and uh, you notice how the sinuses are deep only at the base and not at the tip. That's our bur oak, Mercus macrocarpa. Yeah, a couple of guesses for bur oak or white oak. Okay, well, 
Okay, well, you're getting, if you're white oak or burr oak, then you're, then you're close. Um, so the next one I think is the white oak. So that's the, now you can see how the sinuses come to about the same depth all the way along. Whereas the burr oak, the sinuses are, are deep here and then very shallow with the teeth. So good, good, that's, that was a nice review. But it's not over yet. Of course, everybody. <laughs> which, which of the oaks is this acorn? Notice the relatively thin cap and this long stalk. There's only one elk we've done that had that long stalk acorn and that's swamp white oak. Yeah, we had several guesses for swamp white oak. Uh, for chinkapin and red oak. This chinkapin oak, uh, if you just looked at the acorn, the cap would be, it is a thin cap, much like this, but much, much, covering much less of the acorn. And uh, red oak would have, uh, and we're gonna do red oak in, in a second, so it's coming up, has that beret-like cap, more chestnut brown acorn with a beret-like cap. How about this one? Okay, we've got a, Acorn here that uh, has a, a cap that sort of sits on top of the acorn, doesn't cover much of the acorn, and it's very knobby on top. That's our white oak. Lots of guesses for white oak. Couple Good. guesses for uh, red and swamp. Okay. Well, this is this is a day a day to learn. Under red oak would have had uh, wouldn't have had that knobby cap. A red oak cap is shallow, uh, but it, it's not knobby. Like, like the cap, and the other one was swamp white oak. Um, remember, swamp white oak would have a long stalk. Ooh, this is this is a tough one. All right, so this one, you know, if someone just showed me a picture and. So I can see it doesn't have a stalk on it, so I know it's sw not swamp white oak. Otherwise, I, I would puzzle over that a little bit. You notice there's no, there's that tiny little loose fringe of, of scales along the edge of the swamp white oak that's lacking here. This is a chinkapin oak, uh, not a common oak in the region, and so you're not going to see this one very often, but, but a beautiful tree. So, um, yeah, that's for a chinkapin and a couple of reds. Okay, all right. Well, we're getting getting there and here oh lots of the right answer in the chat okay, okay. well that's that's good I mean this one um oh this is a little bit hard that was baroque of course um uh, This one's a little bit harder. All right, this one has that cap that covers oh, a third to a half of the acorn. It's thick, or at least relative to the size of the acorn, and sort of dome-shaped on top. This is our, our Hills Oak, or Quercus ellipsoidalis. Uh, the name ellipsoidalis uh, was given to it because some of the first specimens that were sent back to Europe where it was named had a long ellipsoidal acorn, which you will see on Quercus ellipsoidalis at times, but it's by no means really characteristic of the species. It's just an occasional feature. Uh, these scales should be pretty tight along the edge. Uh, black oak, if you go to Indiana Dunes or, uh, or south in the central Illinois, you see a lot of black oak that has a very loose fringe of scales there. Ooh, this one is, uh, again, a little bit harder. Um, Uh, notice here the cap is thin. It's sitting on top of the acorn, or in this case, the acorn sitting on top of the cap, but it covers very little of the acorn. It's a very thin acorn. You get a little sense of how the acorn is squished nose to tail. That's 
That's the pin oak, Quercus palustris. Um, guesses for pin and red. Oh yeah, well, red oak's a good guess because if this were in person, this acorn is about a third the size of red oak, but you can't judge the size in a picture. They have very similar shapes. And there is our red oak for comparison. Notice, let me go backwards here. Look at how the thin cap and this broad, almost round uh, spherical acorn is in, inside of that. So they're really similar in shape. This is much larger um, acorn. And this cap has a very glossy chestnut brown color when the acorn is mature. Now we're going to move on with the trees with some compound leaves. And the first of those will be our hickories. Uh, and the first of the hickories will be shagbark hickory, which is the most common hickory of our region. It's so common that when people say the word hickory, I think usually they mean shagbark. And uh, hickory becomes synonymous with that tree with a big, long, shaggy pieces falling off or sticking off, off of the trunk. Um, now, why do, I, why do I say that this is a leaf? Some of you are just starting or wondering, that looks like five leaves to me, Tom. One, two, three, four, five. And yet I'm saying that it's one leaf, a compound leaf. And the, the reason why we say that's a leaf, it's not just my idea, this is, this is true. This is a leaf because on the way woody plants are put together, the leaf, simple or compound, it doesn't matter, at the base of the leaf where it joins a twig is a bud. It's always in the axle of a leaf, and the axle means on the inside of the leaf attached to the twig, right at the inside of the leaf, called, that's the position, the axle, axle of the leaf, there is a bud, and that's the embryonic shoot. Next year, this bud could break dormancy and another twig plus leaves could grow out of that. Um, so when we, if we're looking at this and we start here and we work our way back, when we get to the base of this leaflet, we look and there's no bud because it isn't a leaf. We get to the base of the whole compound leaf and we find a bud. So that's how we know that this is a compound leaf and not a simple leaf. And we call this a pinnate leaf compound leaf, pinna, referring to feathers, uh, that symmetry around the central axis. This is called the rachis in a compound. Leafs, really it's the old mid vein of, of a leaf, simple leaf from which the compound leaf evolved. Uh, and we have a pinnate arrangement of, of leaflets here. They're actually even pinnate, not pinnate. We won't go into those kind of details. This is a pinnately compound leaf. Uh, Shagbark hickory has nuts with very thick husks and the husks fall off as the nuts mature. You can see how thick that husk is and when you find them on the ground often the nut and the husk will be separate by that time. If there's anything left you can easily if the husks are still attached to the nut, you can easily pop them off with your fingers, big thick husks. The nut on these is really delicious, just tastes very much like pecans, which is another hickory um, from, from the southern, more, more southern areas. Uh, only this nut is really hard to get into. So getting into a hickory nut to eat the, eat the meat is really hard. I like to look for nuts. We have a shagbark hickory in the in the drive right around at Lost Valley Visitor Center where you park. And uh, in the fall, people will run over the nuts and you'll find them broken on the ground. And I look around to see if I can find one that I can nibble on a few pieces of, of the nut. It's very sweet and delicious. Uh, the twigs, really, really easy to identify in shagbark hickory. Big football shaped buds with these loose scales. And of course, the shagginess of the shagbark hickory. This is, this is a tree that has so many good identification characters. It's, uh, it's nice to have a few trees like that that sort of shout their name to you as you walk past. Bitternut hickory a little bit harder, particularly in the wintertime. But in the, in the summertime, we see that it has pinnately compound leaves again, but not just five. It can have seven to nine leaflets. Shagbark hickory rarely, though it can have seven leaflets, uh, these leaflets will be, we generally have more leaflets on, on, uh, on bitternut hickory, a little bit narrower. Uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about leaf shapes. Notice in the, uh, these leaves have this point. We have convex and then concave shape here. 
coming to this sharp point. We call that acuminate tip to the leaf. It has an acuminate tip. It's actually very common on leaves to have acuminate tips. We will see some today that are merely acute and a few that are obtuse and one that has this really str strange emarginate uh, tip to it. But uh, yeah, this, these are all words botanists use to, to establish a language for communication between botanists in describing plants in language. Here is the bud of bitternut hickory. Here's bitternut hickory. This is the easy thing to see. If you have any twigs that are near the ground, you can see this uh, by, by late summer, fall into the winter, this bright yellow bud, often called yellow bud hickory for that reason. Very, very nice identification character. The nut um, is much thinner shell than the shagbark, much thinner shelled. And, and in the fall, when this matures and comes off the tree, you'll generally find the nut still in the husk because it'll only split open here at the base. It'll split open at the base. The husk will still be attached to the nut. The name would imply, and it's true, the meat of the nut is quite bitter uh, and so not particularly good to eat. I don't know if you can wash that bitterness out. Maybe some of our listeners uh, know that today. I know with um, some plants you can wash that bitterness out but uh, with, with water, but uh, bitternut hickory is not a, not a good one. Shagbark hickory is delicious. Bitternut hickory has a beautiful bark. Uh, it doesn't shout its name, but it's a beautiful bark. It's relatively smooth, totally unlike shagbark hickory in its overall appearance. And yet if you walk up close, all of the hickories, and there are many hickories in the southeastern United States, if you walk up really close, you'll see this same beautiful modeling of light gray and slightly darker gray and silver colors on the, on the bitternut hickory. That bark sort of stays intact and it's, um, well, essentially no shagginess to the bark whatsoever. Hey, Tom, we had a question about the hickories. Okay. Are they as sensitive to acid or alkaline soils? Both of them are pretty uh, wide ranging. They're not particularly soil sensitive, at least in my experience. I don't associate either of them as being now that, I mean, sometimes soils planted around homes are extreme because of extreme things that have been done to the soil. But in nature, I don't see either one of these as being sensitive in, in the way that white oak is sensitive to acid alkaline situations. Walnuts are in the same family as hickory, so they have a lot of similarities, but some distinct differences. We have two, two, two uh, plants in the walnut genus Juglans. Juglans nigra, nigra black walnut is the really common one. Populations have probably in fact increased since European American settlement. It seems to have done pretty well for itself, particularly after the farming era. It has reproduced uh, long pinnately compound leaves, um, many leaflets. I, I can count them two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14. So lots of Lots of, lots of leaflets, much longer and more complicated than hickory leaf. And the fruits are these big ball-shaped fruits. There's a nut inside of this husk, just like with a hickory. But these husks have no suture lines. The husks don't rot off, or they don't fall off. They eventually rot off. And they release these black, more or less spherical nuts um, with a black walnut and very dark, almost black in color. Uh, black walnuts are super good in flavor. Uh, to my taste, much more flavor than an English walnut. But an English walnut is easy to crack to get the meat out of, and a black walnut is much harder. This one takes a hammer or a special, a really special nutcracker to break to break open. Oh, one of the one of the little treasures in every walnut tree is the chambered pith and the twig. Uh, you find a dead twig on the ground and slice it open with a sharp knife. You'll find this wonderful chambered pith. I'm not sure what that does, but it's a wonderful ID character. And both of the walnuts, we'll look at butternut here in a second, have these stacked buds. This is in fact the, the, uh, the I think the, I, mean, I always get this, my dyslexia kicking in, which is a flower bud and which is a, I have to look it up each time. I didn't look it up this time. One is a flower bud, one is a vegetative bud. Uh, and it has these broad uh, shield-shaped leaf scars with three big, big 
bundle scars from a leaf uh, that looks something like the face of E.T. If you, it's a 1980s movie memorabilia, but um, watch it again and you'll see, you'll see, you'll see black walnut in E.T.'s face. And uh, the bark of black walnut is a, ni is a nice rough color, um, uh, sort of anastomosing ridges. If you break off a little piece of black walnut bark, you'll see a rich brown color inside it. That's often what I do when I'm looking at trees out in the woods and it's a big tree and there's no branches close to the ground and all the branches are tangled together up above. I'll just walk over and break off just a tiny little piece of bark and you can see that rich chestnut brown color in a black walnut. Hey Tom, we had another question. Okay, go ahead. Does the type of leaf have any relationship to the grain of the wood? Uh, no, all the walnuts have an open grain wood like the oaks. Good question. Oaks and hickories and walnuts all have an open grain wood. So if you do a lot of woodworking, you generally use a filler to fill that wood grain. Uh, it's just to keep the, you know, changes in atmospheric moisture for causing the wood to warp. They all have an open grain wood. Um, the walnuts are a darker color than the hickory woods in the walnuts, but uh, yeah, the leaf form, it doesn't really, it isn't really characteristic of the wood, wood type. Okay, so many, many features are the same for, for juggling scenario, butternut, long compound leaf, many leaflets. Um, this one is very rare today. It was always a rare tree, now becoming much, much more rare with a, with a canker disease. There are a few still left around, you can find them, but uh, very rare on the ground today. So if you find one, uh, let me know, let the authorities know, because they're, they're really, uh, really becoming endangered in our area. We don't know what the long-term prognosis is for their survival. Uh, the nut is very much like a black walnut, but long, more long, a long egg shape. If you put the two next to one another in your hands, this much has much sharper ridges on the nut, probably not obvious from the photographs, but a much more sharply ridged nut. Twigs, very similar, uh, white fuzzy buds. The terminal buds are longer. On our butternut, you see the buds are stacked again on the black walnut. This is, I mean, this is, this is obviously true sometimes. It's not like don't care, associate these really large buds with, a, with the uh, butternut. I suspect these have started to expand. But notice this, I used to call this a mustache, but if this is E.T.'s face, it has to be eyebrows and not a mustache. That doesn't make sense to be a mustache. So I'm gonna call that big hairy eyebrows from now on, right on top of the leaf scar. On the black walnut, by comparison, that those eyebrows are missing. Nice identification character if you're puzzling between those two. One of the really nice characters of butternut is this bark, and it's a beautiful bark, uh, sort of impressionistic, silvery gray color. It's impossible to put this bark into words. These anastomosing flat top, silvery gray ridges make a make a lovely pattern. It's quite different from the black from the black walnut which is a much rougher bark, uh, much darker in color. I'm gonna throw the ashes in here, not closely related at all, but they do have compound leaves. The walnuts, as you may have noticed, I didn't point it out, have alternate, we'll look, talk about leaf arrangements, alternate. Here's a node where a leaf attaches, that's what you call, point where a leaf attaches is a node, there's only one leaf. You go up here and there's one more leaf. So that's alternate arrangements, now we're gonna look at ashes, which are opposite in arrangement. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. We're gonna start off comparing white ash and green ash. In fact, these are two species that are again in trouble today. And for, the, for a similar reason, we have exotic pests that have come into the region. This is uh, the emerald ash borer, not the, not the canker disease. Uh, this emerald ash borer is decimating populations of white and green ash, and we don't know the long-term prognosis whether these will survive as a vital part of our flora or whether they will fall out over the next decade. Um, white ash, uh, in comparing the two white ash, uh, tends to have less obvious serrations along the leaf edge and it's much lighter underneath, more of a bicolored dark green above, or at least a darker green above and much lighter below. I didn't have a picture whether you turn this leaf over, but it's not nearly the same contrast 
on a green ash. You see more consistent serrations along the leaf edge and not that contrasting colors. With the twigs, again, it's quite a contrast. The best, one of the best characters, though it's not present on all every white ash, is this funny peeling skin. If you look over the whole tree and at a lot of twigs, you'll generally find this. It looks like the, you know, when you were a kid and you smeared the almost glue on your fingers and you waited for it to dry and you peel it off, it looks just like that. Only it peels in little, little bits. Uh, and you can, with your thumbnail, just start to peel that little skin uh, off. Um, but the other thing that's always there are these horseshoe shaped leaf scars. And, and the fact that the leaf scar makes more of an angle and creates a sort of knobby twig. When we look at a green ash by comparison, it has D shaped leaf scars and much less of an angle and less, less of a knobby leaf. And it lacks that that Elmer's glue skin on the leaf. So, and again, I'm gonna say this over and over again, these characteristic forms are best developed on the crown leaves. So if you're looking, as you're often with ashes now, the whole, the larger tree is dead and you're just looking at sprouts, these characteristics are much harder to judge. It's just the way it is today. We've lost most of the larger ash trees. The compare, the contrast is still there, but it's much more subtle. Looking at the seeds, the white ash has, I'll just pull the green ash up. The white ash has a broader seed cavity by comparison. And these uh, wings um, are attached much more to the base of the seed cavity. With green ash, it's a long, narrow seed cavity. And these wings extend down over at least a third of that long, narrow seed cavity. Mature in the fall. Um, Two more ashes. These are two uh, blue ash and we'll do black ash next that are minor species by comparison. Blue ash is the only one that seems to be weathering the storm of the emerald ash borer. Uh, emerald ash borers seem to be at least less attractive to the blue ash so it's surviving in fact increasing in populations in some area as competing ash trees are dying out. Uh, Fractinus quadrangulata gets its name from this square twig. It's the only ash in the North American flora that has this square twig with little, little corky ridges along the angles. Uh, the leaf probably looks a little bit more like green ash than it does white ash. Short little, what we, little stalks on these leaflets, we call those stalks petiolules. Always, always, botanists love terminology. So the stalk of an individual leaf is a petiole. The stalk of a leaflet is a petiolule. Um, there's one to drop on your friends at, at dinner tonight. Uh, so let's look, quickly look at uh, seeds shorter and dumpier with a very broad seed cavity on both. Let me pull, pull up the, on both black ash and blue ash, these short, dumpy little seeds, very different from white ash and green ash. Note that with the black ash leaflets, notice how there is no, no stalk, no petiolule on the leaflets. They're long leaflets, two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven 10, uh, 11 or so. This is seven to nine leaflets on the blue ash. So a long compound leaf on the black ash uh, with no, no little stalks on the leaflets. This, uh, there's so many images when you're out walking in a black ash swamp. This one grows in alkaline swampy conditions. Typically, though, you will find it in floodplains, the Des Plaines River floodplain, you'll find some black ash sometimes. When you get under a black ash and look up, there's a wonderful ladder sort of silhouette against the sky. It's just really characteristic. I can't put it into words other than say, you just see that ladder silhouette against the sky. Blue ash uh, leaves just, yeah, make a very different, different pattern. Here, the, the black ash twig, note both it's lacking the squareness and look at the terminal bud. See the little, the little, this easy to see in person. The, the terminal bud sits on a little stalk. Notice how these lateral buds are right next to the terminal bud on the blue ash and here there's just that little bit of stalk, stalk terminal bud characteristic of the black ash. Okay, let's try some, another quiz here. How about nuts? Okay. 
Okay, so we've got a nut. If this was a walnut, it would be a big smooth nut, so it's not a walnut. Uh, it's, a, it's a bitter nut hickory. It has this flanged husk. Remember the, the uh, shagbark hickory, the husk started to split apart on its own. How did we do on that one, Jackie? We had several bitter nut guesses, a couple of butternuts, black walnut, and shagbark. Okay, well, you're all in the right, right family. We recognize the bitternut hickory by its, well, you can't really tell the thickness of the husk now, by, by the flanges on the husk, by those obvious flanges. I mean, if you went south and you got into areas where there was water hickories and pecans, you would see there's a whole group of hickories with these flange nuts. But in our floor, we only have that one. All right, let's try another one. Okay, how do we do? Whoops. Yeah, I had some guesses for black walnut. Many guesses for black walnut. Okay, well that's, this is one, I have one in my backyard. So this is a, the big, somewhere between a golf ball and a baseball size nut that starts to shrivel and then rot off and releases that nut with the wonderful sweet meats. Here's another one. Changing it up on you, here's a twig. Okay, how about, how about that one? We had a guess for bitter nut. Okay, that's a, it's a little bit harder. This is a shagbark hickory nut. I know it's hard to judge sizes. This would be a big, thick twig uh, with a large uh, football-shaped bud with those loose scales. So that's our shagbark hickory. Another twig. Had some guesses for bitternut and butternut. Okay, butternut's correct. You, know, you can, if you look for it now, often these features look really small. And, you know, I don't have, particularly I don't have especially good eyesight now, but uh, uh, I can see things that other people don't see, and it's not because of my eyesight, it's because I know what, to, what exactly what to look for. And so I'm looking for those eyebrows, or what I formerly call the mustache, right there and there. And there are those fuzzy little eyebrows above this shield-shaped leaf scar with the white fuzzy buds. White fuzzy buds tell me it's either a black walnut or a butternut. The eyebrows tell me it's the butternut. There's a, there's a nice characteristic leaf form. Okay, how are we doing? This is a pinnately compound leaf. Uh, guesses for shagbark hickory. Yep, that's it. Remember, bitter nut would have had generally seven to nine leafless, the walnuts, many more. Ooh, one, of my, one of my favorites. Guesses for butternut and bitter nut. Yeah, this is butternut. Actually, butternut's not a bad guess. I have, sometimes I want to see butternut so badly when I'm looking at butternuts, I make them into a butternut tree. They're both relatively smooth, very both silvery in color, uh, more obvious ridges with, with the butternut bark. Do we have more? Yeah, we're going to, oh, close up. Remember those twig characteristics. Remember your leaf arrangements are now bud arrangements on this. Had a guess for a couple guesses for blue ash. Yeah, exactly. For these four angled twigs uh, with little corky ridges along the edge. There isn't anything else in our flora. Ashes are all opposite. I uh, notice the buds are right across from one another. Maybe a little bit harder. This is not sure you see very often, but the feature that I told you about is there in spades this time around. I'll just point to it. You may not remember it. This is an ash. Uh, this is our black ash again. 
see that stalked terminal bud? It's really the only ash in our flora that does that. Sometimes it's a short stalk, sometimes like this one, a longer stalk. The buds are often even darker than this, which I guess is the reason we're calling it black, because nothing else about the tree is black. Um, ashes all have colors for some bizarre reasons. There's white, green, red, blue, other than pumpkin ash, which we're not doing. I guess there's one ash that doesn't have a color. Right after this, we're going to take a break. So just a couple more quizzes. It be hickory or walnut. So it's got to be one of the ashes. Which one? Fairly long. Guesses for white ash. White ash, yeah, long, narrow fruit, uh, relatively for its size, broad seed cavity, and this wing attached to the end. Whereas with a green ash, you have this very long, narrow seed cavity and the wing attached a third or halfway down the seed. So we're gonna, I'm gonna take, we're at 10 after 11 now. I wanna take a break. You give yourself just a couple of minutes to relax. Uh, um, decompress for a minute and then we'll go on with some more trees. Maples are next, a nice genus to look forward to. So we'll say at 11.20, uh, we'll come back. And if you need to get a drink or go to the bathroom, you can do that. Uh, if anybody has questions, we'll kind of hang around and answer questions too. So we did have a few in the chat. Why okay. is the ash group named Ash? Say that again. Why is the ash group named Ash? Oh. <laughs> Why are they named Ash? Well, that's one I'll have to like. That's that one. Now you've piqued my curiosity. See, I've been teaching, learning about trees for 40 years, teaching them for 30 years, and yet I never was asked that question before. This is the first time. And I've, an ash has an obvious meaning of wood ash when you burn things, but is that how it got its name? Hmm. Well, we'll have to look that one up. Somebody, maybe someone can Google that quickly and we can have group participation here because I don't know the answer. I'm glad somebody asked that question, but I don't know the answer. But I don't know the answer after today. We had a question of, do you offer a study guide for review on my own? Uh, well, this will be available. You can go back through this many, many times. Uh, I've. Uh, I've got some uh, some materials. I well some lists of resources, um, some books that I've used that I've found useful. We're going to actually kind of open it up to the to the group uh, tomorrow to suggest online resources people can use because I'm, I'm I'm sort of was pretty far along in my learning about trees before I before the advent of online resources. So I think group participation would work better. There, I do have a handout on some of the terminology with leaf sizes and shapes or leaf shapes and tips and bases and all that terminology I'll be using today. We'll have a handout, we can PDF handout, we can give you on that. Um, I've never written a book on it, so I don't have, have the book I can give you, but uh, there are lots of other really good books out there. Um, and I'll, I'll make some of those suggestions later. Uh, just walked the Clem Arboretum yesterday. Great tree ID everywhere on the grounds. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I worked at the Martin Arboretum in the early 90s, and uh, um, I still, uh, when I go there and I have nothing to do but look at trees, it's a day in heaven to me. You just walk around and look at trees. Uh, one after the other, after the next, after the next, after the next, after the next. I can just do it for hours on end and never get tired. It's just uh, like visiting with old friends, um, <laughs> learning things each time. I had a comment earlier that Winding Creek has a huge stand of shagbark hickory near the pond. Yeah, yeah, that's, a, that's another tree that probably has increased in its frequency after European settlement. We don't know the answers to some of the questions of why they do that. It does tend to be more fire sensitive than the oaks. Its shaggy bark will catch on fire sometimes. 
uh, that may be the reason why it was at least a little bit less common in the past, but certainly native tree and was, was a part of our oak woods going back many thousands of years. And it's a, it's a handsome tree along with being easy to identify. You don't often see it growing uh, in, in neighborhoods today because it's a slow growing tree and no one likes slow growing trees, I guess. People always say, I don't want to plant that, meaning usually an oak, uh, but they could be referring to Vickery too, because I'll be, I'll have to be 100 years old before it's big enough. And I just need it. I, I know, I know we all, instant gratification is the nature of our society today, and we all want to reap the benefits of some of our work, but try to try to think about the next person that owns a house and the person across the street 20 years from now, how much they would enjoy that oak tree, and uh, think twice before you choose. Um, beautiful trees, they just grow a little bit more slowly, not nearly as slowly as people think. Oak hits its stride, it's growing a foot or two a year. Um, so uh, you'd be surprised how quickly they grow if they're healthy. Let's see, a couple more comments just came in. Um, you tend to see oaks adjacent to shagbark hickories usually, right? Uh, yeah, the, the woods, the, you know, the remnant oak woods uh, of the Chicago area was, you know, 97 percent oaks to start with, but hickories were a minor component. Generally, they've increased somewhat, so you tend to see them mixed together these days. Um, hickories have been somewhat more aggressive in moving out of those stands into adjacent uh, clearings that uh, were left behind, you know, say in a natural, in a natural area like glacial park, areas that were cleared for agriculture or pasture, and then abandoned. Hickories will often move out into those grassy areas more aggressively than the oaks, and so you'll find stands of young hickory um, out there uh, where oaks not accompanied by oaks, but they're generally in the same sort of communities originally and nearby. They're dispersed mostly by squirrels too big for blue jays to move around and so they're generally dispersed within 20 or 30 yards of where the, of the parent tree so wherever you find a young hickory there was an older hickory at some point in the past not far away we had a comment i've been enjoying the wooded island at jackson park in chicago and they check out books at the library to help study trees so I, remember, I remember going on that island Many years ago, okay, I had a little project there, an educational project with some local uh, school children from a local school when I was with Northeast Illinois University. So it would have been yeah, late 90s. Uh, that was a, you know, it's funny that you go on a bridge out to the islands, really, really pretty out there. Um, I once heard that an oak needed to be about 25 years old before it produced acorns. Is that true? Um, it is, uh, acorn, the trees will often produce acorns earlier in life than that. Uh, now, whether the acorns are viable, from a bur oaks in particular, I've seen bare acorns at 10 years, but um, they will uh, certainly become more, produce more acorns as they get older. Um, with bur oaks, I mean, the species may differ from one to the next, I wouldn't, I, assume that's probably true. Bur oaks and elbows start to bear acorns earlier in 25 years. Whether they're all viable, I don't know. But, uh, but you know, it takes a little while. But so sometimes we exaggerate. You know, I see people who on the internet says 50 years. We sort of start make, exaggerating. And they make oaks into weaklings that, that require forever to reproduce. And they're really not, really not like that. They, they once dominated the landscape and we're quite aggressive. We probably would have thought of them as weedy trees if we were here 300 years ago. They're just a little, they're not, they're not good at exploiting the sort of opportunities that European American civilization creates in the world around them. So they seem like weaklings sometimes, but they're not. It's just that we haven't figured out how to manage the world in a way that frees them from some of those disabilities. So, uh, someone who has a red oak started at the base of a white oak in their yard, but can't see a way to remove without killing the red. Yeah, it's hard to move. Uh, I mean, oak trees 
if you, you know, an, an oak seedling coming up from an acorn, if you get it in its first year and take, and they're willing to take a good bit of soil with it, then it's not hard to transplant them. In my experience, I've transplanted a lot of them. Now, if you just dig with a garden trowel and only take the first two inches of root, it's going to die. But if you use a shovel and are willing to go down and take a good bit of soil with it, you can transplant them at that, at that stage. Um, but, uh, you know, as you get four or five years old, they're, they're, even oaks like bur oaks that are taprooted when young, eventually that taproot starts to, to, uh, to break apart and you get a, a different kind of system. But in its early stages, it is really taprooted and getting to the bottom of a, of a taproot of a five-year-old tree is really hard. And so it's really hard to move them at five years unless you have a tree spade and you want to dig a huge hole in uh, you. You best leave it alone or just have to sacrifice it if it's growing in the wrong place. So look out. I used to do that at my old house where we had a big baroque tree in the backyard is watch out for the little oak seedlings in the spring and move them around. And we had four very handsome 15 year old oak trees uh, growing in our front yard when we left. I was very proud of those, I'm kind of like a father, you know. Um, I just saved them from a mower and uh, really handsome little trees. They're probably 15 feet tall, so yeah, everyone says the oaks don't grow fast, but they were really big enough to enjoy starting from an acorn and they didn't start yeah, I would say where they were probably um, yeah, 12, 14 years old, so. All right, it's 11 20, so um, there's a couple other questions. I'm going to save those toward the end so we can make sure we get through the presentation, but we, we will get to those. Okay, you know, this, the way I'm teaching this, all, all the online education, all of these Tom Talks are experimental. I do something different every time. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Well, the way I'm doing this one with these quizzes and pausing and waiting uh, is, is a, a technique. And I want you to tell me whether you think that's too slow, whether you think I should speed it up. Um, I want your feedback. We'll be doing this again tomorrow. I can speed up. I can slow down. I can give you more time. It's really up to you. I want to make this meaningful experience for you. I want you to learn something. I can go faster. I can go slow. But we're just going to keep chugging along here and take up the maples, which is a really important genus in the eastern United States and in the Chicago area. But they can be dangerous, uh, particularly in the fall. Uh, always look up, you know, widow makers are not just dead branches. Sometimes those maple leaves can be uh, fatal. Um, I'm joking, of course. The first one we do is sugar maple, which was ecologically an important tree in the Chicago area, even though it was uh, rare in, in a sort of spatial extent of sugar maple groves was tiny in the Chicago area. These sugar maples are very sensitive to fires. So, uh, so they occurred in very few places in the Chicago area. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. But, uh, but important because they really nailed down that one end of the, of the fire sensitivity gradient. And in those little refugia where the fires weren't occurring, sugar maples were an important species. Now here you see a leaf that has lobes and sinuses, just like oaks, but what's the difference? Well, the oak leaf was symmetrical around a center line and we had lobes coming off of the center line, but this one, all of the lobes seem to be growing from this central point where the, where the petiole attaches. And we call this a palmate. I don't know if I put that, no, I didn't put that, that one in. Uh, we call this a palmate leaf shape or palmately lobed. The, the palmate meaning like your hand, palm of your hand. The lobes radiated away from a central point. Uh, fairly deep sinuses and notice on the lobes there are a few major points. This is a, a exotic tree, the Norway maple, that uh, is not super common, but not uncommon as exotic invasive in our area. And I'm gonna do a lot of exotic invasives at the end of the day tomorrow. But uh, this one does creep into our natural areas and it's so similar to sugar maple, I wanted to do that to, 
put it in here right now. You'll notice it's similar in the way that it has relatively deep sinuses and lobes with a few points on it, but just back up and look at the whole leaf shape and then look at this whole leaf shape. What's the difference? Both of them have these three really prominent lobes here, but look at this, this fourth and fifth lobe at the base of the Norway maple leaf, and then look at this sugar maple. Just has a couple of points sticking out. Here you have more of an obvious lobe with minor points on it. So this is a more broad plate-shaped leaf. Plat in fact, that's what the word platinoides, um, it's a, similar to plane trees, which have a broad plate uh, shape of the leaf in the genus Platanus. So that's a Norway maple. And during the growing season, if, you, if you're at all in doubt, pop one leaf off and Norway maple like, will exude a milky sap from the base of the petiole. Nor sugar maple doesn't have a milky sap. And this is the other look-alike. This is an important, this is a native look-alike, fairly rare in the Chicago area. This is black maple. If you, uh, if you took your show and went west to, uh, to, to Iowa, you would find uh, mostly black maple and very rarely sugar maple. What is the difference? Well, let's look at the leaf. The, the sinuses are a bit shallower. And notice the lobes, uh, the points on the lobes are much less pronounced, almost rounded. And there's a little bit of a drooping character to the ends of the lobes, a little bit more than sugar maple. Uh, these pictures make it look more obvious than it actually is. I would have to tell you that as a warning, the warning label in person out in the field, those characteristics are often much, not nearly as obvious as these two pictures uh, would indicate, but a character that is more obvious is the very fine fuzz on the underside of a black maple leaf and the lack of that fuzz, a smooth, smooth leaf, or what we call glabrous leaf on the sugar maple. So that's the character I go to when I'm, when I'm puzzled. Um, and I think I may be looking at black maple. I've seen black maples most often in major river valleys in the Chicago area. And even then often sugar maple is the more abundant species, but black maples are there. So it's something you keep, keep a look out. For. I'm sure it's in McHenry County, I'm, and I'm sure I've seen it in McHenry County, but I can't really place it exactly where I've seen it. But it's an interesting native tree that does belong to the region. This is where we get a lot of our beautiful fall colors in the Chicago area, from the, uh, from the rich oranges and red colors of the sugar maple leaves in the fall. The seeds are, uh, or the fruits, are these paired uh, winged fruits, uh, always paired in the maples, always these paired winged fruits, just different sizes and shapes of wing and held at different angles. These uh, uh, probably at 120 degree angles to so sometimes around a 90 degree angle between these, these two, a fairly fat seed cavity. There's the bark of sugar maple and the bark of black maple. Now, this is a pretty characteristic bark of black maple, but sugar maple is so variable, it's hard to tell those two apart. You'll get some sugar maples that look very much like the black maple. The black maple has a more standard, rough, roughly furrowed bark. Sugar maple tends to be more platy and some of these flat pieces that are almost peeling off. Black maple really doesn't do that. Um, so uh, something you keep your eye out for. That's, that's, that's a pretty fine distinction. Those, aren't, those two aren't easy to tell apart. Uh, I think I put in, yes, my opposite arrangement slide here. This is what we mean by opposite. The two leaves are paired across from one another because the buds occur in the axle of the leaf. The buds are paired across from one another. There's our opposite arrangement there. And sugar maples have these brown buds with many scales, very hard. If you hit these buds with the, with the soft part of your index finger, particularly that terminal bud, it's slightly painful. They're stiff, hard buds, many little brown scales. Very curious, it's the only maple in our region with buds like, like that. I think that was the last of my maples. Yes, okay. 
Now here's where sugar maples fit in, in what I call the catena of plant forms and fire influence. Sugar maples are our most fire sensitive, characteristic of our most fire sensitive woody plants. As we move up that scale, the oaks are definitely a major step more tolerant of fires, hence their dominance of the woodlands of the Chicago area for the last 12,000 years since the climate, 12, 10,000 years since the climate warmed up and oaks became the dominant species. Yeah, maybe a little fact you didn't know, it was dominantly the spruce, spruce and then spruce pine forest for its first few thousand feet years after glaciation. How you get around the fringes of bur oak groves where the fires are even more intense. Hazels, hazel shrubs are super tolerant of fires. You can burn them back to the ground and I swear they seem to be healthier when they come up the next year than they were the year before the fire. As we move out into the prairie, the, the prairie forbs are next hardiest. And then when we get all the way out into the prairie, grasses uh, dominance increases. Grasses, uh, for a variety of physio physiological reasons I don't want to go into here, are the most fire adapted grasses and sedges, the overall plant form. And so we have this, this catena of fire influence. And when we look at it on a landscape, we see that and out in these prairies and big flat areas that used to burn very often, we have this dominance of prairie grasses and forbs, hazel thickets, really gone from the landscape today, but according to our original survey records, hazel thickets were most common around the fringes of the oak groves, bur oak dominating in the savannas and the fringe of the grove, white oaks dominating the interior of the oak grove, and where you have steep slopes in the from your fringe excuse me, refugia from those prairie fires, the sugar maples and red oaks would be the dominant species. So, um, so we see both the catena of plant forms and this catena of plant communities that occur along this gradient. So we talked a little bit more about soils and variation in soils and how that tells us about the zonation of plants in a landscape. Our landscapes are only a couple hundred years Post, uh, your post kind of Native American influence. So these, the fire catena and this fire zonation of plants is still really obvious in our landscape today when we're around remnant natural areas. All right, let's talk about some other maples. Silver maples, which are really a tree of, uh, of river floodplains, a rare tree of river, river floodplains in the past, now are quite a weedy species and very common in our landscapes today. Silver maples have these very deep sinuses and long lobes with many little teeth on them. Uh, yeah, deep sinuses and long narrow lobes, again, the palmate lobing of a maple. The buds of silver maple uh, are reddish. So remember, sugar maple have those sharply pointed brown buds with really fine brown scales. Both the silver maple and the mobile do next red maple have relatively fewer scales. Uh, they start green and then they turn red as the, as the summer and fall go on. Uh, these are the clusters of flower buds, particularly on trees that are growing in suburbia. You find the twigs are sort of beaded with these masses of flower buds. And the, and the seeds, uh, silver maple was way overplanted after Dutch elm disease swept through the Chicago area. Green ash and silver maple became, and honey locust became the panacea, and those were tremendously overplanted in the 1970s. So, if you're in neighborhoods like where I live today, silver maples were just massively overplanted. They're everywhere. It's, it's a handsome tree, but frankly, it belongs more in the river floodplains than it does in your front yard. It drops sticks all over the place. Uh, these big whirly bird seeds, uh, I like the name whirly birds. That's what I called them when I was a kid. These big whirly bird seeds. Uh, um, all over the place in your yard. Again, all maples have these paired wing seeds. Here the angle is about the same as a sugar maple, but here the seed is much longer, more of a long ellipsoidal uh, seed cavity. Red maple, by comparison with sugar maple, is really pretty rare in the Chicago area. It's growing in some in acid situations, and because most of our soils are not acid, or at least acid and slightly wet, uh, we just don't have a lot of red maple. Uh, you'll see it in some terraces of the Des Plaines River where I've seen it growing 
natively it grows in uh, swamps in the uh, Indiana Dunes uh, National Park uh, where you have acid sandy swamps. Notice a very similarity to red oak and, or excuse me, silver maple and red maple, but notice these leaves have relatively shallow sinuses and the lobes are much chunkier and shorter. Both of them are very silver underneath. Not really any distinction there. Both of them can have these red petioles. So even though they call this red maple, the, red, the silver maple can have red petioles too. That's not a good character. So the overall shape of the leaf, the length of the lobe and the depth of the sinuses that you can tell them apart. The seeds are much shorter, a um, little bit more of an angle, a uh, sharper angle between the two, but just much shorter. Not the, the, the red color is only early on. They'll turn brown much like the silver maple or sugar maple seeds later on. The bark of the silver and red maple are pretty easy to tell apart. Again, these, these two are so different in their occurrence. Uh, the silver maple is very common, the red maple very rare. Red maple, you'll in the north woods, you'll see this growing with sugar maple in the uplands, and that's hard to tell apart. But the silver maple is much shaggier. Loose pieces are, in many ways, almost more similar to shagbark hickory than it is to red maple or sugar maple. Our last maple we're going to do today is the box elder. Um, and uh, that's the only maple in our, in our flora that has compound leaves. Uh, there are box there are maples in asia that have compound leaves so it's not the only one in the world but it's the only one i think in north america that has compound leaves and certainly only one in the eastern united states three leaflets uh, i think we have some other pictures three leaflets here it's five leaflets i've seen occasionally even seven and the leaflets are very irregular in shape uh this one uh almost looks like a red maple leaf point poke at the end of this box elder Leaf. This three leaflet version looks identical to poison ivy. But uh, what, what's the leaf arrangement of maples? Always opposite. So uh, I had an emergency call from a church where I do some landscaping, and they uh, they were they wanted them they wanted them poison ivy taken out of the churchyard. They were panicked by the fact there was poison ivy there, and I went over and there it was box elder which was an opportunity for a little lesson in tree ID. Um, here, even more irregular shapes to, to the box elder leaf. Again, three, five, occasionally seven leaflets, very irregular in shape. The twigs, however, will start off green and turn uh, reddish purple in color, and they will develop this white waxy covering. Uh, the covering, is a loose wax that's, that's excreted on top of the twig. It's called epicuticular wax. Epi means above. Cuticular means that the leaf or twig are covered already with a hard wax, a hard permanent wax called the cuticle. And this is epicuticular. It's wax excreted above the cuticle. You can just wipe this off with your finger. It's kind of fun to do that. And the wax sometimes will squeak, squeak between your fingers. The uh, seeds. A box elder has a very long, narrow seed cavity and a very steep angle, 60 degrees or less between, between the seeds. Make it, uh, this one, like the silver maple, the seeds mature uh, in late spring, and so you'll get a lot of seeds falling, whereas sugar maple and Norway maple were, were in the fall, as is red maple. So um, differences in their maturation times. Now here comes our, our, I think this is just our maple quiz, okay? What do you think? Look at the lobes, length of the lobes, the width of the lobes, whether it's a few points or lots of little points along the edge of the lobes. So this one is our? Cat guesses for silver and sugar. Silver maple, all right, sugar maple. Uh, Sugar maple would have uh, shallower sinuses and only a few major points here. You'll see there's, there are many points along the edge of this. This is silver maple. There's really a group. Silver maples and red maples are in one group. We call those the soft maples. Sugar maples and Norway maples are in the other group. The 
hard maples, or I guess there's a difference in wood. I've never worked with red or silver maple wood. Uh, probably is a difference in the hardness of the wood. But in the soft maples, we have many more uh, little points along the edge of the lobes than with the hard maples. Okay, let's try another one. Got a couple of guesses for Norway, one for sugar, a couple for sugar, and okay. black maple. Okay, well that's good because they're, that's all close. This is the Norway maple. I notice all three of those have, if you just, if I just gave you a little close-ups of each one of these lobes, I couldn't tell them apart. This could be the lobe of a black maple, or excuse me, of a sugar maple or Norway maple. You wouldn't quite expect those long points on a black maple, but these basal fourth and fifth lobes down there, almost to sixth and seventh lobes. That's, that's the Norway maple, the really broad plate shaped leaf with big fourth and fifth lobes. That's the Norway maple. Okay, and what's that one? Narrowing down your choices. Got some guesses for black maple and sugar maple. Okay, well, that's two. Those are the two. You're down to, that's a tough choice. In fact, I'm sure I get that wrong sometimes out in the field. This is a sugar maple, a bit more prominent, a bit more prominent uh, points along here. About the only thing you could go on with this, you really can't see whether the ends of the lobes are drooping. You probably expect a little shallower sinuses on black maple, but again, that's a, that's a tough characteristic. Okay, how about this one? We've got some guesses for fox elder, red maple, and white ash. Okay, well, well, uh, remember the ash has a compound leaf. So this is a simple leaf. You really can't see the bud there, but that's a simple leaf. Well, the white ash is bicolored like that. So if you took this to be a leaf, then you might get confused there. But this is a twig. Each of these are leaves, and it is bicolored, uh, but we spec that on red maple. It has these three, really much a three lobe leaf with a relatively shallow sinus and a short stubby lobe as opposed to the silver maple that had deeper sinuses and a longer, more narrow lobe. Soft maple is a silver and red having the many little serrations or points along the edges of the lobes. And that's just a leaf. And so this one is the many guesses for box elder. Yeah. Yeah, well as well, process of elimination. Plus it's well you're 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 catching up here. Irregular leaf shapes. Uh, this could be a leaflet of a poison ivy. Uh, and, but each each box elder leaf leaflet is a little bit different. Uh, it can be three leaflets, it can be five leaflets, it can occasionally even be seven leaflets. Ooh, there's another one. Hmm. What would that be? I have a couple of guesses for sugar or silver maple. Okay, well, sugar maple is correct. The long, long pointed, not, it's, it's a small bud, but it's pointed in brown scales, many small brown scales, and really firm to the touch. I know you can't feel the firmness, but you will when you go outside and you look at sugar maple trees, take the opportunity to walk over and just push that, that the tip of that of that terminal bud into the soft part of your index finger and you'll feel the points. How about, how about this one? Oh, excuse me, that last one. If that had been a silver maple bud, we would have expected fewer scales and more either greenish or reddish in color. Had a guess for a silver maple. Okay, well that's not a bad. The box elder. 
Yeah, not a bad guess, but this is box elder. We're starting to see that the waxiness to the outside, pretty rare on silver maple. I don't know if it's ever there. Uh, the, the purplish color. Um, one of the interesting things that I really haven't pointed out about maples, you see how the leaf scars on either side, because the leaf formerly went up this way and this way, the leaf scars join together in the middle. Um, and with uh, box elder in particular, that's really obvious. It forms these V-shaped when looked at from the side. And a little bit of the sort of white fuzziness to these buds, not that, not the green or red scales of, of, the, of the silver maple or red maple buds, and certainly not the small brown scales and pointed bud of the sugar maple. Okay, now we've got about five minutes left here. I can uh, start to do just a few, a few more trees, uh, and then we'll, I want to, I want to stop in time to, 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 uh, to sort of have a, to, to answer your questions and also maybe to get some of your feedback about the pacing that we've used today. Um, I'm not sure why I had that last um, thing in there. All right, let's look at black cherry. Um, oh, that's why. Um, we're going to look at simple alternate leaves, and here is our simple alternate leaves there. Um, so that's the general pattern we're going to be looking at. So black cherry is one of those. Alternate meaning, notice how this leaf comes down and attaches to the twig and there's no other leaf coming off there. At that node, there is only one leaf. That's the definition of alternate. So uh, the leaves of uh, black cherry have this lanceolate shape, sort of a beautiful long widest near the base with that long tapered, I think we call that an acuminate tip, uh, not super pronounced on black cherry, but you see a little bit of that reverse curve and point at the tip of a black cherry leaf. Notice how the flowers are on these long stalks. We call that a racine. Each flower is on a separate little stalk that attaches to the long uh, peduncle of the flower. There's the bark of black cherry, the, what's universally called the burnt black potato chips or black potato chip bark. Uh, and there are the little, uh, the formerly what we call the uh, um, uh, lenticels, drew a blank there, lenticel breathing structures on the twig. I, I'm using, I'm talking a little bit less about winter tree ID characteristics today so we can focus more on the summer one, but the lenticels of the, of the young stem are pushed out under these big bark flakes. Um, so hence the, hence the sort of burnt potato chip color. This is, this is that raceme of flowers turned into a raceme of cherries. If you haven't tasted these, you, you, should, you should give them a try. It's a large pit, but, uh, but the soft flesh around it has a sort of sweet, bittersweet flavor. I love, I love the flavor, but it, probably the bitterness is a bit much for most people. Uh, but I always look forward to the fall. I miss them this fall for some reason. I couldn't didn't find anyone that was really bearing heavily with branches long enough to the ground. The birds really grab them pretty quickly so they don't hang around for a long time. The buds are good winter tree ID characteristics, these little pointed buds, often with, with slight, with little bits of red and green colors in them, uh, really characteristic. And if you scratch a twig of black cherry it has a very powerful cyanide, bitter cyanide odor. Uh, it, that chemical, that poison is created by when you disrupt the cells and it's trying to stop grazing animals from eating it. And uh, I'm really a nice ID characteristic. It's, it's present in all of the cherries, but it's strongest in the black cherry. All right, one more similar plant. Well, we look at the hackberry. Simple, Alternate, there's the twig, there's the simple alternate leaf, different shape, huh? Well, let's see, look at that leaf base. It's sort of lopsided, isn't it? Small on one side and big on the other. We call that an oblique, or I always used to call it an inequilateral base, but I think we've shifted terminology and people are using the word oblique more these days, so we'll try to use that. 
You'll notice how one lobe comes down much further than the other. Notice another thing about the hackberry leaf. The cherry leaf had a really a strong central vein, and that was that really defined the venation. With hackberry, there are three strong veins from the base. Very characteristic of that plant. It will come in handy later on identifying hackberry. The inequilateral or oblique base in those three veins from the base. Hackberry has a really weird terminal bud. It goes off, it's actually a, a, a lateral bud, but it ends up at the end of the twig, and it's almost at right angles to the twig. Uh, it, you, you think there was some growth deformity, but no, that's just the way they are. I guess that's a nice identification of character. Hard to believe why, how that would have evolved, but it did. And it ends up being a nice identification character. Ah, the bark of hackberry is a beautiful characteristic bark. You can see how it grows, these layers of hard cork growing up as the tree grows and, and growing up in these distinct ridges. It's a little bit harder than it looks. You'd think it would be like soft, but it's not. It's relatively hard to the touch, uh, but it has these odd sort of random ridges of hard cork growing up from the trees. Beautiful, beautiful bark, very characteristic of of that species, we have one in our backyard that's, that's just old enough to start showing some of those corky bark characteristics. Here is the fruit of hackberry. Like, like a cherry, it has a pit. And we call fruits that have a pit a droop. And this is a peach, which is a really large droop. But the pit of a peach is, it, there's a pit inside of a hackberry. It's small, uh, not, not, not as uh, convoluted on the surface is this. The actual seed is inside of the pit. This is the inner ovary wall that hardens around the pit. This is a, just how a droop is created. The inner ovary wall creates a hardened wall around the seed. The middle of the ovary wall, the mesocarp, becomes the soft flesh of either the hackberry or the peach. And the exocarp, the outside of the ovary wall, becomes the skin in either case. Now peaches are, are a small uh, droop that was then bred over time to have a lot of mesocarp, a lot of flesh to eat. But I just wanted to point that out. This is specialized for animal dispersal. The endocarp, that hard bony covering, really protecting a seed as it goes through the digestive tract of an animal. All right, let's, let's stop for there today because I wanna, I wanna field some questions now. And uh, so, both questions and comments. Is this, is any questions about the trees we've done today or other tree questions, trees that are growing in your yard, whatever. And also I'd like some comments, just whether this pace is working for you, whether you'd like me to go a little faster or a little bit slower. I can do either one, I'm happy to. I'll start with a, a couple of questions we had from the break earlier that we didn't get to. Is there a rough diameter age formula for trees? Uh, no, there are some trees grow at such different rates. I mean, if you, I mean, I've, I've done a lot of aging of trees, oak trees, just you know, doing a lot of oak studies over the last, we're going back actually 30 years doing lots of studies of, 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 of oaks and their ages. And you can find a diameters up to a factor of three to five difference in the diameter of a tree, even if they're the same age. It just depends whether they have a lot of water, how much sunlight they were getting, how much competition they were getting in the rooting zone from other plants. So that's a tough one. But what you can do uh, is uh, if you find one of those formulas online, uh, and there are some out there. Uh, if you find those formulas online and you're walking in the woods and you see a lot of young oak trees, then the odds are all those oak trees are the same age, even if they're not the same diameter. So what you should do is measure about 10 of them and then take the average diameter and that will plot exactly on that line. That's how you use the size and age, how, how the size of oak trees to determine the age is by looking at the age of the cohort, or the diameters of the cohort, averaging them, and those will plot in a nice straight line. We've done that. The individual tree doesn't, but the, the cohort does. It's more of an answer than you wanted. 
something that I've worked on and been frustrated with over the years. Um, you really can't tell the age of an individual oak by its diameter. But if you know there are a lot of oaks of the same age, you can tell the age of the whole cohort. All right, next question. Uh, do you recommend any trees for a boulevard? Well, there are lots of trees for boulevards. Um, you know, it depends, uh, you know, like parkways and things. Uh, th those tend to be highly disturbed soil areas. They're, they were probably soil that was put in there as the road was being constructed. So you're certain that the soil is not an old weathered soil as you may get, you know, if you live on the fringes of suburbia or in a place in an older home away from the foundation before they would scrape sites. Sometimes you'll have soils that have a remnant of the old original soil in your yard that are a bit more weathered, but whatever the soil has been disturbed, it's, it's, it's probably going to be very alkaline right at the surface. So you want to plant things that are tolerant of al al alkaline soil. So some things you wouldn't plant there are pin oaks and bald cypress and white oaks and blueberries and rhododendrons and those sorts of things because those are very pH sensitive. Uh, red maples are always also pH sensitive. Uh, the hybrid between red and silver, I, I don't think it's called autumn blaze, but uh, that one is less pH sensitive, though still uh, I have seen it get chlorotic. If it's in an area where the soils were, were, are very uh, alkaline, so I would steer away from, from both, frankly, uh, in a parkway. Um, so it's more what not to plant than, than what to plant. Uh, if you gave me a list of things you like, I may help you to choose between the list, but I don't want to, all I do is just re repeating my favorites, you know. Plant a bur oak tree, because I like bur oaks, but uh, <laughs> pretty tough. Um, in, in urban situations. So we had several comments that the pace is good, our pace is great, excellent pace, uh, good pace, but my brain's a little overloaded. Uh, well, it will be, <laughs> and, and you should expect that. That's, that's, in, in something, in something like this, I mean, I'm, I'll say I'm still learning about trees 40 years after my first introduction. I'm still learning about them. I'm still absorbing new information. It will get easier and easier and easier and easier. Keep your mind open. Don't get frustrated that you don't remember everything as you go. There's no way any human being can do that. Um, it will be, it will get easier. It's a long-term thing. Trees, trees, uh, trees will be around. You'll be able to see them for, for, for a long time. So take it a little bit at a time. This is your introduction. Just sit back, learn, relax, try to learn what you can. You can watch this over and over again if you can stand the sound of my voice. Um, but, uh, and you can take care advantage of some of those resources and you, you'll start to learn. You know, it took me a week to learn my first 10 Latin names. So that's, that's how hard it was. So I can learn 10 in a day now because I'm familiar with it, but it's hard to start with. I had a couple. Uh, thumbs up and hand claps to that. Okay. Um, we had a question, will a recording be available? So yes, we, since we're doing this in two parts, it'll probably be up on Monday. We post to our YouTube channel, so it's at Discover MCCD, and there's a playlist for Tom Talks. Um, one of the other ones that we had up there you might be interested in too is one of our first ones was on Twig ID. And it goes a little bit more in detail into uh, twigs and bark. Um, so you don't get the treat of Jackie's lovely voice on that one. <laughs> it's my comedy, comic attempt at well, semi comic attempt at comedy, but uh, but it's uh, it's worth watching for other reasons. Uh, yeah, the winter tree I do become to take up many of the same themes about um, trees. So. There's a question on what tree would be the best option to benefit butterflies or other pollinators? Butterflies and other pollinators, well, I'd certainly go with the insect pollinated trees or cherries, cherries and plums. Uh, basswood is a, um, we haven't gotten to that uh, yet, but uh, basswood is a uh, wonderful fragrant flower um, and uh, attracts bees. Uh, yeah, I would probably, 
try to look for your insect pollinated trees. I'm trying to think just offhand. I wasn't quite ready for that question. Other things that we're doing. So crab apples, apples, cherries, um, uh, basswood, uh, yeah, things. Most of those are in the rose family other than basswood. Yeah, those would be my things to start with. If I think of anything else, I'll, I'll tell you next tomorrow. You can ask the same question tomorrow. I'll try. Mm -hmm. Ductal Somebody mentioned Doug Tallamy. Doug Tallamy's uh, book, that's a good one. If you're, uh, I think I may have dealt with, I probably did deal with pollinators. He dealt, dealt a lot with feeding of, uh, of, the, of the larval forms of insects and how native trees are much, much better for hosting a diversity of larva and therefore are uh, increasing the diversity of the insects that hatch from those larva butterflies, many of them. All right, how do you tell a young black cherry from a choke cherry? That's a good one, and we'll talk about choke cherries tomorrow. A young black cherry from a choke cherry, when you're, when you're, the, the black cherry, I mean, I'm just talking about it, and I'll be able to show you pictures tomorrow, but choke cherry has a lanceolate leaf, the, 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 the so a long, narrow leaf, the widest point is near the base. The black cherry has that. Did I say that? I, I'm, I, I get off reverse. The black cherry has a lanceate leaf with the widest point near the base. The choke cherry has an ovate or broader leaf with the widest point toward the tip. Uh, the choke cherry has very sharp teeth. The teeth on the black cherry are like little bent over teeth on a saw. So there's quite a contrast if you look at those two. The buds, if you later in the summer and in the fall, the buds of choke cherry are much longer, sort of light brown, dark brown, and, and more and harder and more sharply pointed. The black cherry buds are shorter. See some green and yellow colors in there, and they're sort of softer to the touch. So there's a lot of ways to tell the two apart. It's an important distinction to make in restoration. We're often removing black cherries because they're overpopulated in the woods just because they increase so much during during and immediately after the grazing era of farming. Whereas choke cherries are really a quality native shrub that's relatively, relatively uncommon and one we don't want to get rid of. So important to tell the difference. Thanks for that question. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to note it's 12 o'clock if anyone has to jump off. We will hang on and keep answering questions. We've got quite a few in the chat for you. So okay. get ready. <laughs> Uh, so well, 99 I can, questions. I can I can stay here as long as yeah. as long as anyone wants to wants to listen. So um, so this one will stump you. Which tree did they use to make the Louisville Slugger bat? Well, uh, the the uh, in the old days, and I would assume still, uh, most bats were made from white ash. Uh, uh, Louisville Slugger wasn't different from other bat manufacturers. Uh, there are some. Uh, in the old days, uh, some of the sluggers, I can't remember, probably it was in Babe Ruth, there was some, some one who used hickory, which is a more dense hardwood. Uh, so it would weigh more for the same size. Nowadays, batters are starting to use uh, sugar maple because it's harder. And I think they feel like they get more velocity off the ball when they hit it, but it's also more brittle and it fragments and sends more sharp, sharp pieces flying back towards the pitcher if the bat shatters uh, with the fastball in the right place. So uh, yeah, white ash was the dominant bat. Uh, with emerald ash bar, the, uh, there's now a glut of ash wood on the market, but it may be not a glut in 20 years uh, when, uh, when the supply of that ash wood uh, starts to peter out because it doesn't look good for white ash in the future. All right, that's answered that much easier than I thought you would. I thought that one would throw you for a loop. Yeah, well, yeah, you never know. You never know what old time. All right. Uh, in a previous chat, you mentioned a buckthorn lookalike that shouldn't be removed. What was that? Um, I, I think it was probably choke cherry. Um, the. Uh, Yeah, um, it's, a, it's probably choke cherry. The leaf shape is similar, they're broad. Um, yeah, 
the, the easiest way to tell those apart is the leaf arrangement on buckthorn is sub-opposite. So, so you'll see the leaf, leaves are close to opposite and sometimes truly opposite and sometimes not quite opposite. That's one easy way to tell them apart. The, uh, the serrations on the leaf of choke chair are much sharper. Buckthorn has, has fairly small blunt serrations. Um, the, uh, the terminal bud's very different. The long uh, uh, terminal bud on, uh, on uh, choke cherry, whereas black cherry, really the, the twig ends in a little thorn, uh, not a bud at all. So if you look at those three characteristics, you should be able to tell them apart pretty easily. Good question. Well, those are important distinctions to make in the field. Um, we had a question. We may have to come back to this one later. Uh, she said, I grew up out west, dryland, semi-arid alkaline soil. Trees aren't native to the specific area. Any tree suggestions to try? So maybe add in the chat if you mean suggestions for further west or, or around here. Uh, we kind of talked a little bit about some trees for this area. Um, yeah, you'd have to you know, look on look on your, your websites in South Dakota or somewhere. I know that, I know that. I used to hear, and this is, this is just sort of hearsay, huh? since I really haven't done much work in ed educational work out west, that green ash was one of those things that would move out along the, uh, what they called the gallery forests along the river valleys as you got out of the Great Plains. And it was one that was, both grew well along the streams, but would also tolerate drought and, and growing along the uplands there. But, uh, but other than that, I'm not sure I can do you much good. I could find out for you by tomorrow if we repeat the question, but I wouldn't be uh, hard pressed. Um, I've been out to South Dakota recently. Uh, I know they plant a lot of lilacs out there, but uh, I'm not sure about trees. Uh, that's a good question. I'll have to maybe try to look up some resources on that this afternoon. Do you have guesses or can you point us to somewhere that can give us ideas of how many different life forms use a tree? Life forms. Well, um, that, that, that probably would, you could probably write in a sort of encyclopedic answer to that question because if you start from the root hairs and go all the way to the tips of the, of the of the leaves uh, and consider all the ways in which other organisms could interact with a tree. It would be hard to think of anything in the forest that wasn't interacting with a tree directly or indirectly. Uh, all the plants in the understory are interacting with a tree of the shade it casts with a, with a way in which it picks up the moisture and nutrients from the ground, the mycorrhizae, the fungi that are in, that, that move in and out of the roots of tree roots and then the plants and other trees around them connect the trees so that they connect plants together. And so there's, there's a sort of mysterious sharing of sharing and, and there's a sort of moral quality to that probably that isn't appropriate, but certainly the, the water that's moving through plants is moving back and forth between plants. And so, yeah, and, and insects are, and there are fungi that are pathogenic to trees. There are fungi that are absolutely essential for their growth. Um, there are lots of, of the, 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 the diversity of microorganisms living in the rhizosphere in the soil is uh, thousands and thousands of species of bacteria and actinomycetes and things there. I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a very, very, very long answer. It's fascinating. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great question because it's just, it just points out incredible diversity of life that you don't see um, that you think it's just a tree and it's a flower under the tree, but it's just thousands and thousands of species around you when you're walking in a forest, you're only aware of a few. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, we had a couple of comments about missing face-to-face -face education. I know we oh. prefer it in person too, especially when- Don't, don't get me started. Freeze. <laughs> don't get me started. I'll go on my speech about missing. Yeah. yeah. I miss it. I miss it dearly. Yeah. I've been challenged and uh, occasionally frustrated, uh, occasionally, um, well, I can't actually high five Jackie because it's all, <laughs> cool, but occasionally that sort of sense of, yeah, it's a different challenge. It's very, very different. There's its, its own satisfaction, but I do dearly miss 
being in the woods and walking around and in the prairies with people. And we will do it again. We'll do it again. We just have to wait. We just have to wait. Mm -hmm. uh, someone asked, what's the YouTube channel name? So again, that is at discover MCCD under the playlist for Tom Talks. Uh, somebody asked about Doug Tallamy's webpage for Fauna Associates. So maybe we can uh, look that up and send that out after the webinar. That'd be a good one, yeah. Um, there's a question, what about hornbeams? But I didn't scroll down until now to see it, so I'm not sure when that was sent, if we were talking about something. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll get to those. Uh, you know, we, haven't, we haven't finished with trees yet, so we'll, we'll get to those. They're interesting, uh, smaller, they're generally smaller, mid-sized trees, hop hornbeam and American hornbeam. In fact, I like them both, which is my wife and I. I just planted them around our home uh, within, the, I think it was earlier this spring. Uh, um, planted them, just beautiful, uh, beautiful smaller trees. And I, and I do have to mention, or I may be in big trouble, that this today marks the 29th anniversary of my meeting my wife at a tree um, course in the Martin Arboretum. So that's uh, that's what trees can do for you. I mean, uh, yeah. but, <laughs> Some of you are already married, you don't need another one, but um, that's a, it, it uh, brings you into contact with wonderful people. <laughs> uh, I got a comment. Sugar maple was and is used for making bowling pins. Okay. Uh -huh. That makes sense. It's a very hard wood, uh, probably for the same reason. It bounces like, like you want a bat to bounce when it hits a baseball. A local town is starting to plant tamarack on a parkway as a replacement for silver maple. Does that make sense? Uh, tamarack. Uh, I would. I'm. I wonder if they're planting the, the, the Japanese larch. Uh, I'm. You no, know, our our tamarack grows probably mostly. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if it's pH sensitive. I know in nature it occurs in typically acid. Soils. Now there, it's tamarack is a larch. It's in the genus Larix. And if you go to other continents, Europe and Asia, Eurasia, and, and either side, the uh, the larches are upland trees. They're not swamp trees. And so, a lot of the larch-like trees we see planted ornamentally are either Japanese or or uh, or I think there's a European larch. I don't remember the, the Latin I'm in right now. Uh, and those may be relatively pH. Uh, I'd, I'd have to look that one up. Uh, I don't <laughs> those species very often. Um, it looks like this might be our final comment for the day. Uh, Wilhelm and Rarissa, I'm not sure if I'm saying the last name yeah. right, Flora has plant and insect associates. So. Yeah, oh yes. Very, very much. It's another good place to look. Um, but no one can, no one, I mean, that's, it was a wonderful question because no one can exhaust that, that list just goes on and on and on and on and on. It's just the way the, the world is put together. Um, and uh, I think a good sort of a, um, a thinker question uh, when we talk about restoring ecosystems, it's a, uh, we can restore the pretty flowers and plant the trees, but restoring which is not a bad thing. It's just that restoring the whole system will take a long time. I mean, that's the way it should be. It took, took, took a while to break it and it will take a while to fix it. But we and generations after us have all the time in the world. We just have to keep at it. All right. Well, I think that's all the questions. We will be back at the same time and the same link for tomorrow. Um, do you have any hurting comments? Uh, no parting comments for today other than uh, we will we'll be doing much the same thing tomorrow. I'm going to rearrange the presentation. I've got a sense of, of, of the pace at which we're moving, which is good. I, I mean, I enjoy this. I enjoy the interaction. I don't like just, you know, a long two-hour blast of me talking with, with a PowerPoint. I much prefer this interaction, even though it's not verbal and it's not face-to-face. -face. I can't see the question in your eyes before you ask it. 
we still enjoy this more. And uh, well, yeah, we'll just uh, um, look forward to more of the same tomorrow. Great. We'll see you then. Have a good so day, long. guys. So long. See you tomorrow.